Hi. Last week, I reviewed this UT8806E 6.5-digit bench multimeter from UNI-T. As promised, we're going to do a teardown in this video and take a look inside. If you recall from my teardown of the UT8805E 5.5-digit bench meter, that meter uses a MAX6225. The MAX6225 has a 1 ppm per degree temperature coefficient and has a long-term stability of 20 ppm, so I'm actually very curious to see what voltage reference they are using in this meter. Alright, let's open it up. I was wondering where they kept all the fuses. Now I understand where it is. You can see we have this compartment underneath the case here. I bet this is our fuse compartment. Yep, you can see that. So the glass fuse would be for our low current range, and this HRC fuse would be for the 10 amps range. Let me remove the shooting can as well. Now, I think I should be able to remove the panel here so we can see the circuit board a little bit better. Let me remove the rear panel here. Now I think we should be able to remove this board from this case. Alright, I had removed the main board from the case. And similar to the construction of the 8805E, you can see that the 8806E also uses this kind of a board to board connector between the front panel and the main board. I didn't take off the front panel when I did the teardown of the 8805E, but from the pictures I took, you can see that the front panel circuit board on the 8805E is quite different than the one we have here on the 8806E. And by the way, I will upload some of the high resolution pictures of this teardown to my website, and I will leave a link in the video description below so you can check them out. Anyway, let's actually take a look at the front panel circuit first. Not surprisingly, it's using an STM32H750 microcontroller. And the H750 is the value line, and it has an ARM Cortex M7 core. And of course, here would be our programming header. Up here, we also have a push button. I'm not entirely sure what that push button is for. The coin cell here is for the onboard real-time clock. And of course, we have this ubiquitous 14094, which is a shift register. From Silk's screen here, you can see this board was specifically made for the 8806. This protruding piece of the PCB is actually for an LED here, that is, in between the front panel sockets. Here's a view of the back panel. To the left, you can see that's where the mains power coming in. The connector up here actually is connected to the transformer tap selector inside the IEC receptacle. Mains fuse is also inside that assembly. And you notice also we have this unpopulated port here, and that's for the GPIB option. Remember that the case of the 8806E is slightly longer and slightly narrower than that of the 8805E. And if you look at the PCB here, you can see that it essentially occupies the entire space. So this PCB is considerably larger than the one in the 8805E, and the layout is almost completely different. I just reoriented the PCB. The right side is towards the front panel, the left side is towards the rear. And because we have two sets of input jacks, one is at the front, the other one is at the rear, we have these two thick wires linking the front and end. Those are for the high current range measurements, and those are switched by these two relays. The other input ports would be switched by this GAN switch that is located at the front panel. Since we have a RS-232 port back here, of course we have this MAX-3232, which is a RS-232 line driver. And here we have a pulse transformer that is for the Ethernet. And here we can see the PCB version of the main board. Here we have a header that is not connected to anything, but if you follow the trace here, you can see the trace goes all the way to this section and it drops to the other side of the board. And it continues here, you can see, and then it pops back up. 
If you keep following the trace, you will see that it leads to the front panel connector. Since this meter has GPIB as an option, I'm guessing this header is for the GPIB connection. Although it is a little bit odd that the implementation of the GPIB seems to be on the front panel instead of on the mainboard, given where the traces were originated here. Back here you can see a mop and a gas discharge tube surge protector for the rear input. Just like the 8805E, we also have a cooling fan on this 8806E. What is different is that if you recall, in the 8805E, the linear regulators are on heat sinks, and a fan is blowing directly over them. On this 8806E, we also have a few linear regulators, you can see a couple of them here and here. But these linear regulators are surface mounted. The transformer used has two output windings, one of which is supplying portions of the circuitry which is powered by linear regulators in this section. And here is where the transformer winding is connected to. Although if you look closer, let me try to zoom in a little bit, you do see we have a couple of these inductors, and they look very suspicious. The markings on these chips next to these inductors are marked as 5173E, but I could not find much information. Could they be switching regulators? Well, they could, but typically in a high resolution multimeter, you would stick to linear regulators to avoid any unnecessary noise. And if these two are indeed switching regulators, that may be able to explain why the power dissipation of these linear regulators are quite a bit lower than those on the 8805E, as Unity managed to use smaller regulators without dedicated heatsinks. Now I'm actually wondering if Unity could have done without using the fan if they chose the same TO220 regulators with heatsinks, like the ones used in the 8805E. But of course, given the layout you see here, we really don't have a lot of space to put these large linear regulators with heatsinks. But I have to say, it would be nice if they could do away without a fan, because the operation would be much quieter. The other winding from the transformer is connected here. And if you take a closer look, we have this MP14820S, which is a step-down switching converter. And if you look at where the output traces are going, it's actually going all the way to the front panel as well. So at least the front panel is powered by this switching power supply circuitry. Again, like I just mentioned, this is a little bit unusual, as digital multimeters of this resolution typically avoid using switching devices because of the potential noise. Of course, I'm sure Unity must have done all the calculations and concluded that it probably doesn't matter. Moving towards the middle, you can see we have this Trion FPGA. The model number is a T20F256, and I think that's the same FPGA used in the UT8805E. And by the way, all the components used here are top quality ones. Most of the ICs are from analog devices. On this board, we have AD625, programmable gain instrumentation amplifier, which comes at $19 a piece at large quantities. And we also have precision amplifiers, such as AD8510, AD8538, AD8629, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to identify these chips one by one. I will upload some pictures to my website, and you can comb through. Let's see what else we can see here. And by the way, not sure if you can see, let me actually zoom in. By this relay in this general area, you can see we have a couple of these botch wires. And that's the only botch I can find on this PCB so far. I'm hoping they had fixed this in their later versions of the PCB, as after all, we're looking at an early production batch. So that's something they probably had corrected in later design. You probably have noticed these gold traces and some of which don't seem to go anywhere. These are guard traces, and they're used to prevent current leakage, as the input impedance in lower voltage measurement ranges on this meter is well over 10 gig ohms, and driving the guard to the same potential around the measured signal would in theory prevent leakage from impacting the measurement results. And here you can probably see we have this resistor marked as 1606, which is 160 mega ohms. Without guarding, any contamination of the PCB surface could cause leakage and impact measurement accuracy. And here we have a CADOC 1776, that is a voltage divider, again, an expensive part. And let's move down a little bit. The analog to DC converter used in this 6.5 digit meter is an AD7175, which is a 24 bit 250 kilo samples per second Sigma Delta ADC. This ADC is pretty expensive as well, 
compared to the 807172 used in the 8805E, which supports a 31.25 kilo samples per second sampling rate, which is already insanely fast. This one is definitely an upgrade. And if I move slightly right, we will see our voltage reference. The voltage reference used here is an LM399AH. It has a temperature coefficient of 0.5 ppm per degree and a long-term stability of just 8 ppm. And the LM399 is definitely not cheap. Interestingly, there's not any special design considerations here in terms of the PCB layout. There's no cutouts around the voltage reference. And the LM399 has a built-in heater, so sometimes you see PCB designs with cutouts around the IC footprint. But definitely not here, you can see there's nothing special around it. Of course, while there's no special treatment of the voltage reference, you do need to remember that the entire section here is actually under a shielding can. So that does create some isolation in terms of the airflow and thermal transfer from the outside. And what else is not cheap? Well, for the true RMS conversion, the chip used here is an 8637JRZ. And that one is actually quite expensive. It costs around $20 in large quantities. And in this area, just below the voltage reference, you can see more of these guard traces. Near the front panel connectors here, we have some oddballs. You can see there are two of these digital isolators. The smaller one is an IS3720LS. And for some reason, it is mounted on this daughter board. And the daughter board has an isolation slot in the middle, but there's no isolation slot on the main board underneath. The other isolator is an NSI82. Again, there's no isolation slot underneath. If you take a look at the implementation in the 8805E, you can see that in that meter, there are two of these NSI82 isolators, and there is an isolation cutout running across these isolators. And clearly, this is by design, as there is plenty of space around these isolators, and there's nothing underneath here. So if the designer thinks it's absolutely necessary, they would have made the cutouts. And up here, we have another of this MOFs and also another gas discharge tube on this side. And this time it's for the front panel input. And here we have four of these tightly packed MOSFETs. These are two N100s. These are high voltage MOSFETs and they're probably used for switching the inputs. And this white chip next to the MOSFETs marked as 2222, that I think is an opto isolator. Here you can see we have this input resistor string. There are five of these. And each of these is a 0.2 megaohm resistor. So they're in series, essentially forming a 1 megaohm resistor. Using five of these 0.2 megaohm resistors instead of a single 1 megaohm resistor can help distribute the voltage over more resistors. So each one only needs to withstand a portion of the input voltage. You also notice we have a capacitor in parallel with each of the resistors, and that is used to fine tune the frequency response. Now let me turn the PCP over and we can see the other side. And here's the reverse side of the PCB. You can see besides these two fuses, which can be accessed through the servicing panel at the bottom of the case, there are actually no other components on this side. There are some clearly labeled test points here and here and here. And also you can see additional guard traces on this side as well, here and here. Now, interestingly, we have some unpopulated footprints here. Let me zoom in a little bit. You can see we have some footprints for resistors. And on the other side is actually the resistor string. So I'm guessing that this may be an alternative way to form the same resistance. Not entirely sure about that though. Overall, the build quality of this 8806E 6.5 digit bench multimeter is excellent. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something new. If you liked the video, please remember to give it a big thumbs up and don't forget to subscribe to the channel for more videos like this in the future. Your participation makes videos like this possible. Thanks for watching, and I will see you next time.